I'd like to just open open the floor now for anybody who would like to uh, present whatever resource you brought. And um, important, I think, is to let us know why you chose the one that you chose, what it is you liked about it, if you have any quotes um, that you want to read, um, any, anything you want to say about it that will let other people know why this particular resource is important to you. So the floor is Sven. So I talked to you, Ellen, about this book, but I don't think I presented it in any of the previous um, gatherings where we used it and identify resources. This is Bill McKibben's book entitled The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. It was written in 2022. Um, he lives in Middlebury where he's a professor at Middlebury College and he's married to an author, a uh, writer by the name of Sue Halpern. It's, it's fascinating because it hit me right between the eyeballs growing up in Bronxville, uh, New York, in a quite privileged sort of environment. Um, it, it took me dropping out of Dartmouth and going in the Marine Corps to uh, get a real picture of what the world was all about. Um, and this book just brought home to me uh, what's missing today. Um, the flag, obviously it's about patriotism. He grew up in um, Lexington, Massachusetts. His family bought a house for $30,000 right on the green in 1970 that today is worth, well, using inflation numbers, it should be worth 300,000, but it's worth a million. Sure. And that's what the station wagon is all about. Uh, the building up of the suburbs and wealth for those people privileged enough to participate, um, got a huge benefit that those people who were not privileged enough to participate completely missed out on. And it's one of the reasons for this huge wealth divide we have in this country right now. The cross obviously is a reference to the decline of religion um, as a foundation of our society and community, et cetera, et cetera. And the station wagon represents the attitudes that have developed over the last 60 years that have, that have fostered this um, racial and wealth division that we're all experiencing. Um, he, he's very much in favor of reparations, for example. Um, I'll just read what Jamie Raskin had to say about this book when he read it. If we survive the interlocking plagues of climate change, right-wing authoritarianism, and savage inequality, future generations will utter the name of the New England moral visionary and activist McKibben with the reverence with which we speak of Emerson, Thoreau, and Garrison. It's extremely well-written and it is spot on in terms of what our problem is. And I'd, I'd like to further, this is not mentioned in the book, but I have my own view of a possible solution. And it is that every Tom, Dick, Harry, Susan, and Jane owes the country two years of national service. It could be in the military, it could be in the Peace Corps, it could be teaching in a ghetto, teaching in a rural, poor rural neighborhood. And furthermore, I'd like to see Jeff Bezos, I'd like to see the President of the United States set up a meeting with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and ask them each for $50 billion to fund the bureaucracy that would have to be established to make this happen. I think that would make a huge change if everybody put two years in, as I did put six years in and over, actually put six months in, but it was a six year reserve commitment in the Marine Corps. It gave me a picture of the world that I had no idea of 
growing up in Bronxville, New York. Uh, I really think that two years of national service and minimum wage, where you get credits for college after you're finished with your service, um, Israel does it. Uh, where are we? You know, it seems to me we're over the hill headed south and we got to do something about it. And that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Wow. I appreciate that. I, I also read that book, this series of essays, and I was also struck with the first one where he talks about his family's house on the green in Lexington and the patriotism as a little boy that he, a young man, right. experienced. Uh, any questions for Sven? Well, when you start your political campaign, we'll all know the truth. <laughs> What's your plan on paper, Sven? <laughs> Come on. First time. <laughs> we all got to row in the same direction. <laughs> um, thank you. It's hard to be the first one to go, but I appreciate oh, that. Anybody else have a uh, resource they would like to present? I see some of you have them in your hands, so you can't hide. Well, I'll jump in. <laughs> So I brought two books. Come, Should you I can come here or you can do, just make sure um, the camera sees you. Yeah, I want the camera to be able to see. So I brought two books. And how did I find these books? I, got, I love independent bookstores. So this one came from Still North Books. Oh, it's not working. Okay. <laughs> you can do it. You're right there. Yep. There you go. Hey. What the, this one's called, What's Prison For? What's Prison For? Question mark by Bill Keller, longtime <laughs> journalist at the New York Times. He's an editor there. And it's, it's a quick read, and it's, uh, it's disturbing about the problems with the American prison system and compares it with uh, systems in Europe, which are much more enlightened and, and humane. And uh, it, asks, it asks the deep question, what, why, what are prisons for? <laughs> and there's a, there's a list of things you can imagine, and some of them are much more uh, moral and ethical than others. And there is a chapter on race in here, how uh, how race is treated in the prison system, specifically and in the parole system. And it's, it's distressing, but it also does all, also offer some hope. And again, it's a quick read, and I highly recommend it. I got this at Still North Books right here. <laughs> They've got a great book selection over here. And if you're ever in Princeton, I recommend Labyrinth Books. <laughs> That's where I got this one. Okay, so this is a it's a bigger read. It's called Born in Blackness. Born in Blackness. Uh, subtitle is Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. And this is a, the scope of this book is immense. It's about commerce in, in the Atlantic region um, from really starts before the 1400s and the origins of how Portug the Portuguese got interested in Africa. <coughs> First it was about gold, and then it was about slaves, um, <coughs> and how sugar, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, development of sugar as a, as a commodity, <coughs> and how the development of the modern world, which is a modern European society, eventually American society, is so influenced and so was so dependent on slavery and gets into the whole history of slavery and how these small troops in uh, groups of people from <coughs> Portugal and Spain and the Netherlands and eventually England and Belgium were able to get a foothold and to, to take so many black lives and bodies out of Africa. And they did it by disrupting the societies there fomenting civil wars between the people there in Congo and Angola. It gets into all of that. It gets into the fact that um, of all the Africans that were brought to the New World, we usually think, you know, we, we being Americans, we focus on uh, enslavement in the United States, what became the United States, but 4%. 4% of the Africans brought to the New World wound up in the United States. The, the vast majority went to South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, where they had no easier time of it. 
and it, it, it describes the history of what happened in, in each of those areas. And again, it's a, it's a huge scope. It's not an easy, it is well written, but I won't say it's an easy read. Um, it took me a while to even get into it, but eventually I just couldn't put it down. And, and again, the scope is just phenomenal. So those are my two big books. Who's, who's the author? Of that? The author is uh, a guy by the name of Howard French. He is uh, he was a professor of journalism at Columbia University. He was a bureau chief for Central America at the New York Times, and he's been all over the world. He is black himself. He's, he visited a lot of the places where the uh, first sugar plantation was developed in the uh, off the west coast of Africa, and how it was kind of presaged the, the type of how plantations would be put together and run, and kind of the, uh, the dehumanization that was uh, uh, happening there. And he, he, so he goes to all these places where the gold was first traded in on the African coast. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's fascinating in this way, if you like history, and you want to find out really a comprehensive uh, treatment of the, the, the roots of slavery and the impact of that's, uh, that's born in blackness. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if there's any um, anybody in the um, Zoom room who has the book. I don't want to forget. I think there, there are probably people on Zoom who have books that you would like to talk about also. Anybody? Yeah, Josh. Yeah, Josh. It's actually a good segue from the the, uh, the last presentation. The book um, that I want to talk about for a few minutes is called South to America. Whoa. Okay, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, all right, um, there we go. Um, it's called South to America by Imani Perry. Um, and one of the connection points I was just hearing. Uh, is Monty Perry makes the case in South to America by including the Bahamas and Havana, Cuba, that uh, the, the battle for civil rights and equity for African Americans <coughs> is a centuries long battle uh, against empire um, and that it should be treated as such. Uh, she uh, takes pains to trace the uh, family ancestry of many African Americans she knows to the, the Caribbean uh, and involves the Caribbean economy um, and including the current um, tourist economy uh, in her presentation. But South to America starts at the Mason Dixon line uh, with a portrait of Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Uh, which used to be a part of Virginia and was the site of John Brown's uh, raid at the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Uh, she then moves her way south through Maryland, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington, D.C. She has a chapter on North Carolina and its status as a part of the New South, uh, as it was supposed to be in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, uh, Perry is a um, uh, is an African American um, uh, Christian who uh, uses these portraits to delineate a lot of differences between the the white Christian church and the black Christian church in the United States and in these southern states. Um, she delineates between what she calls the white God of Masters, uh, which is a God that seeks to help people to come out on top, uh, a gospel of wealth uh, kind of idea versus the God of slaves, which is a, uh, she sees as a God of liberation. She then proceeds south through the Black Belt, uh, Alabama, Mississippi. She has a chapter on New Orleans, one on Florida, one on Savannah, Georgia. And she makes the argument that uh, in order to understand the United States, we have to understand the American South because we have all become uh, more and more like the American South, uh, particularly in the last couple of generations. 
Uh, there are a couple of overarching themes that go through the book. One is that um, Monty Perry is a professor at Princeton in the African American Studies Department. Uh, <laughs> um, and she uh, is at great pains thematically to really tell us that <laughs> her academic achievements are a community achievement, that it is the support of people in her extended family, people who are not in, in uh, the academic world, people in her family who worked um, in working class jobs uh, who supported her and got her to Princeton. And uh, one of the things she is at great pains to have people understand is that the way she reconciles her success with the community, family community she comes from in the South is to never ever forget them or where she has come from. Um, and uh, that is a, a theme that uh, really um, she pursues throughout the book. Um, her writing is incredibly dense. Uh, she will go from uh, a history of black liberation theology to the continued existence of African liberation movements in Southern states, uh, to various um, Southern dialects. Uh, for example, how people in the South uh, use the word ugly differently than we use it in the North, uh, where they talk about it to um, describe an, an unpleasant disposition. Don't be ugly like that, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, it, it's really a brilliant read that requires a lot of work. Uh, and I would say that the, um, the, the best thing about it for me is that she thoroughly uh, immersed me in understanding the American South. You know, I'm the furthest south of the folks here. I'm all the way down in Boston. Um, <laughs> but I probably share a lot of New England attitudes towards the South. Uh, and she thoroughly disabuses me of some of those attitudes uh, and really helps me understand uh, the depth and the richness of the black struggle for civil rights, not just in 1963 in Birmingham, although there is a beautiful chapter about Birmingham um, uh, where she comes from, but really every day and all the time and how that struggle organizes the black community in the South uh, and helps it survive and thrive, even in difficult times like this. Um, and um, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, uh, it's a book to be taken time with. Uh, you're gonna wanna take some notes and you're gonna wanna talk to people about it. Uh, if I, I, Ellen, can I mention one other book very briefly? Yes, certainly. Even without a visual. Um, one of Imani Perry's colleagues at Princeton is Eddie Glaude, um, and he published a book a couple of years ago, which I finally read in the last year called Begin Again, uh, which is uh, a, a reflection, a meditation on the meaning of James Baldwin uh, to Eddie Glaude. Um, and uh, it's a really useful read and understanding uh, how the battle continues for <laughs> equity in this country and how uh, James Baldwin is a touchstone for continuing the fight for equity in this country, uh, including uh, really immersing himself in Baldwin's defeats and disillusionments and how Eddie Glaude himself is able to use them uh, as inspiration to keep up the fight. Uh, in the 21st century and in the 2020s. So I highly recommend both. And Ellen, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this today. Uh, yeah, I'm writing down all the recommendations so I can yeah. continue the book groups down in Boston. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Josh, very much. I'm really glad to have you part of it. I, I will say that um, I many of you know, probably both of you know that um, Josh leads book discussion groups through the Boston Public Library, and um, there are usually three parts uh, discussing um, a specific book. Right now, I've been taking part, and um, Marjorie Phillips has also been taking part in learning with Josh. Uh, we've already finished two out of the three um, sessions talking about uh, South to America. 
Um, and if anybody has any questions uh, for Josh, and I didn't stop this, or questions for Pat about um, about their books that they've just presented before we go on to um, to additional uh, <coughs> books. If anybody has any questions, some of you may remember that once before Josh presented, I can't remember which book it was, maybe uh, Kendi, who I think it was an Ibram Kendi book um, when you came and presented to Difficult Conversation. And um, right, he runs a nonprofit called Equity Intersection, which you can uh, learn about online. Any questions for either uh, Pat or Josh about those books? All right. Anybody else? Marco. Yes. This one by no means will win a Pulitzer or is any great literary, you know, in depth piece, but Ellen asked me to present it. It's called Do the Work, it's an activity book. And I actually think it's it's quite good. I've picked it up, put it down, picked it up, put it down, and I think there are various elements that can be shared, you know, small portions. It's um, it's co-authored by Kamu Bell, who produces on CNN like mini documentary series. And I think anyone that knows TV and visuals realizes to, sometimes you have to capture people's attention and grab them quick. And for those of us that sometimes have a little ADHD and, you know, we know we want to get through that 700 page tome of something. It's just going to take a long time and your eyes are glazed over this. Uh, and Kate Schatz is a New York Times bestselling author. So they, they've put this together. It um, I don't know. Ellen talks about how reading and learning is doing something. But this really is doing something because it tests you at times with little historical quizzes. I think of the folks that are going to get your citizenship, and I think they know more than some of us Americans do, <laughs> frankly. Uh, there are, you know, games, illustrations, puzzles, conversations, and every page is different. It's colorful. It's great to work with kids on. I mean, I was thinking about my sisters with their grandchildren. They're young. They're much more adverse to learning at a young age, and the more they're exposed to these things, the more it seems second nature. But it shows mothers and fathers with their kids at a park picnic bench. And, you know, one mother says, you know, uh, we don't see color. You know, there's always safe ways to get around conversations or difficult topics. But if you open it up, they're trying to tell you, well, skin comes in so many different colors. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So there's new ways to say things and approach things. Um, I just want to shield them from all the bad stuff in the world, which I think we all want to be shielded. But it says, I wish I could shield them from the bad stuff in the world, but that won't help. We need to talk to our kids about racism even when, when they're young. So there's a bunch of little um, illustrations, activities, crossword puzzles. There's a piece on centering black women's voices and how really, if you're gonna dismantle white supremacy, that's one of the places you need to start. Uh, Great moments in presidential history that probably most of you aren't shocked by, but the things they did to just keep the white supremacy going. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's really worth, uh, I think Ellen, um, Arlene Brock sent this to me. Arlene is one of the people that's been a great influencer with our Queechee Club's DEI Council, and uh, it's good. Before you leave there, does anybody have any questions for Lynn? about uh, do the work. I'm still I'm doing the work. I haven't finished it. Where did you buy it? Where? I didn't. Oh. It was sent to me, but you can go online. Oh, I, I went online myself, and I think it's it's available through uh, Amazon yeah. and everywhere else. And and I would, I would think that some of these uh, book shops, the independent ones, if they know there's a following They'll and order. people are interested, they would order it. Um, I, I will say, while, while we're on, I... Um, mm -hmm. I I I brought I brought I brought my copy too because I wanted to make sure in case you didn't show up that it was that it was Jeez. that it was represented and one of the things one of the things that I I particularly appreciate is that it's it's honest these two people include themselves in the discussion they talk about who they are how they identify themselves. And there are so much of the, the history 
that I didn't know that's presented mm -hmm. as real history. And there's one page that I marked that I was gonna show. There are a series of um, photographs in, in history. There are just hit pictures that you wouldn't necessarily, and, and the question saying, what do you think this is a picture of? And the one, the reason I marked this page is that the picture at the top is uh, two couples, husband and wife, two husbands and wives there, white, and they're looking really, really happy. And the caption is, this is uh, 1955. Who are these people and what are they celebrating? And they're just laughing. They're just having a great laugh. And I marked it because um, these are the two men who were accused of, of killing Emmett Till. And the jury was out for an hour and then came back saying that even though everybody knew who those men were and that the woman lied about being uh, um, attacked by Emmett Till, they were completely exonerated. Less than a year later, they sold their story to either Life or Look magazine. And so everybody saying that they'd done what they were accused of doing. And this picture just showing how joyful they were. And I, I marked it because I have just my just recently this week seen Till and I was there's a sense of horror about, yes. about that. So anyway, thank you, Lynn, for that. Um, other? Yes, Joe. You want to ask questions? Or? I, no, go ahead. Okay. It's, I think it's... Okay. So this book is not necessarily about racism, but it's about a group of people that we've been hearing about constantly recently. The um, LB... Uh, Folks that are experiencing some, some awful, awful uh, stories about them in the news, and in uh, potential laws in the schools, and I've, uh, I've just been appalled by uh, what they're going through. This book is called She's Not Here, A Life in Two Genders, and it is about someone who um, is a changed their gender. Um, it, it was an eye-opening experience. I highly recommend it. Uh, I have a lot more understanding now than I did before. Um, it's written, the author is Jennifer Finley, Finney Boylan, and Jennifer uh, was transfer transferred from a male in his younger years to the current Jennifer. And um, it, it doesn't hold anything back. It's quite, uh, uh, quite upfront about everything that went on. Um, uh, his, his name was James. And James felt from early, in early years that he, was, he wanted to be female, but he, he didn't like those feelings. It wasn't normal to him, and he struggled, and he struggled for quite a long, long time, and he finally came up with what he thought would, might be a solution to his dilemma of um, falling in love. He said, I know, I'll, I'll make it one of my goals to try and fall in love with someone, a female, and get rid of this longing that I have. And he did. He fell in love. They married. They had children. They were very, very happy. It's a, this book is also a love story about their relationship because he did, he did change sexes, and he, they are still together in a very happy relationship, totally different than when they first started, but very loving. Um, so it has a happy ending. That's important. Um, he was a, he started out as a professor in, um, uh, what's the name of that? The, in Maine. Um, uh, Colby? Colby. Colby. Colby, Maine, not Colby, uh, New Hampshire. And uh, he was very bright, very well thought of. He, one of the years he was uh, voted best professor. And um, he had a good life. He had a life that he enjoyed. And, uh, uh, that trick of his of marrying 
didn't make that thought of changing to a female go away. And so he struggled. And the more, the more he struggled, the more he realized he had to do this. He just had to do this. And so he finally uh, talked to his wife. And of course, there was no indication that anything was wrong with their relationship or with his life. And it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. Um, but uh, his mother said, you know, we'll just get by. His children accepted him right away. And um, so he made the difficult decision to go through the surgery. And that is quite an eye-opener. But um, I just want to read part of uh, just a brief paragraph because I think it encapsulates, encapsulates exactly what this book is about. Um, so I'll just read here briefly. Uh, early in transition, it was essential to me that everyone understand the condition of transsexuality, that they grasp the horror of the dilemma, that they understand its medical components, that they know I had done all I could to remain the person they had known and loved, and so on. I had an answer ready for every objection. Um, so then he goes on to say, quite frankly, there are times when I think about transsexuality and I just have to shrug. I'm sorry, I can't make it more sense, can't make more sense to you. But it is what it is, whether I, quote, you am a woman or whether I, quote, had a choice or not, whether anything, nothing matters. Having an opinion about transsexuality is about as useful as having an opinion on blindness. You can think whatever you like about it, but in the end, your friend is still blind and surely deserves to see. Whether one, one, whether one thinks transsexuals are heroes or lunatics will not help to bring these people solace. All we can do in the face of this enormous, infinite anguish is to have compassion. And that just says it all. That's what I felt um, even before reading this book, just seeing what they're being put through now, how they're being judged, and all these laws and rules and regulations about their children are, are coming into play. It's really a sad commentary on our times. Uh, but you're, if you're interested in the actual process that they had to go through and how strong they still are, it, it's, it's an uplifting, it's an appalling but uplifting book, a book, a book generally. Any questions? Thank you very much, Joe. For, and I, I wanted to say that it's interesting to hear you talk about it because the, the issue of pronouns comes up when you were referring to the early part of the book. You talk about he, he this when he was Jim, but then, but, it, right, but Jenny Finney Boylan is she, she uh, always is referred to as she. Um, but it's it's complicated to talk about something because for the first part of the book, um, that, that that pronoun is he. You were going to ask a question. The, the name of the book again? She's not there. She's not there. A life of two genders. In two genders. So he's experienced both. Bless you. Bless you. <clears throat> and he's very other, now. Any other questions? She is fairly within the last year. She co-authored a novel with uh, Jody Picot, huh. who lives here. It's on the bestseller list. I can't remember the name of the deal. There are two of the books that um, she followed with. Um, Stuck in the Middle with You It's her second book. And I don't remember the it's, it's beautifully written, this book. It's, it's very, very, very well written. Called yeah. Mad Honey. Yes, yeah. Mad Honey yeah. Yeah. is the book that just came out. Yeah, that's really Mad Honey. Oh. And, and it's set in a town, like a town near Hanover. <laughs> um, and it's it's really well written, and it's and it's uh, entranced and, and, and not enchanting. It's very entertaining, very thoughtful. It's really an interesting interesting novel. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> other <coughs> other 
presentations here. Oh, oh great, Lori. Parents. What was that? Oh, I think it's green and we can do this together. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really prepare a summary or book report, but I Your book <laughs> two, two books that I've uh, read in the last year or so that really struck me. The first one is Cast by yes. Isabel Wilkerson, um, The Origins of Our Discontent. It's dense, <coughs> it took me forever, um, but it's really well written and it really opened your eyes and made you think. Went along, I think, Pat, with your um, sort of the, the history and the origins of slavery, and it, it um, connects our caste system of slavery with uh, India and with the Nazis. And the Nazis actually studied our system before putting theirs into effect. But what they all have in common is that uh, you need a bottom rung that you can compare yourself and feel better than. And in our country, it's the blacks, the people of color. Um, it's, it's really good. It's kind of changed a lot of things about thinking. She bought, she has another book called um, The Warmth of Other Sons, which is a more personal account, which I haven't gotten very far into, but it's good. She's a really good writer. And the other one is, I really like John Meacham, and um, I find Lincoln just fascinating, and his new book is, And There Was Light, um, about Abraham Lincoln. And in contrast to um, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book a bunch of years ago, which is more, say, nuts and bolts and personalities and people, this is more the evolution of Lincoln's thinking, um, especially his thinking about emancipation and how he got to that point, because we all um, hear the how he, he went into the war to save the nation. And he had to evolve. He was almost against slavery, he saw the horrors of it, but thought the solution was <coughs> to recolonize them. Uh, and he was also very, once he became president, very concerned with what he could actually do and not do. Um, and so I've just gotten to um, 1862 and after, shortly after his son Willie died, which really affected him, um, he was always, I would say, a spiritual person, but not a religious in terms of organized religion. But he had a deep understanding of the Bible and trying to figure out why we're here, what we're all trying to do. Um, and he basically comes to and I don't have my glasses on and I can't find the page, but um, <laughs> the conclusion that, that, that you need, that um, we're here to act morally to, and to, for the other person to make, to do the right thing and the moral thing and what's right for the other person, kind of the golden rule, that is the golden rule. And and considering the war in 1862, it had been going on, and it wasn't really going well for the Union, um, but he felt that the nation, if we were going to wage this war and win this war, it had to come out with a strong nation that everybody could do well in and be together in. And he, um, in 1862, the summer, it was the Transcontinental Railroad that he uh, signed a bill for, um, the Homestead Act, which then had some bad repercussions later on for indigenous people, uh, the Land Grant Act for uh, colleges, again, some bad repercussions, but at the time, um, uh, from. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a few blanks here. But he he was always, he, and he was coming to the idea of emancipation. And he got to this point where uh, if the Union had um, conquered, had won some, some land in, 
South Carolina said. It could claim enslaved people to be, to, to say they were free and to use them, to, to let them fight for the Union, to, to be full Americans. And, um, but he wasn't yet ready <laughs> that summer to, the, the test would be, what would he do you know, if we won the war with all of the slaves? And it, was, it took a while longer for him to come to emancipating everyone. Um, it's a, it's a, he's a really interesting moral person. <laughs> Read a lot about Jefferson in the last year. Different, also sort of an enigma as a personality, um, but more selfish person. Um, and, and Lincoln is really thinking about other people. <laughs> anyway, this John Meacham is just writes really well too. Um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, before you leave, anybody have questions for Lori about either of these books? That sounds very interesting. Meacham's written a bunch of other yeah. books, hasn't he? What else he wrote he um, Soul of America a few years ago, which goes through six or seven crises that our country has gone through where he thought, oh, how are we ever going to come through this? And he pulls together how, as a country, we, our better nature comes out eventually. Mm -hmm. Not always right when, not when you might really want it immediately, but if we pull together, we can. He's optimistic. Thank you. All right, Teresa, it's you. Hi, everyone. I'm Teresa. I haven't met anyone. <laughs> um, I'm from Quichi, and um, I have zoomed in at times, but uh, have not, and I'm happy to be here in person. Um, I brought a book called Courageous Discomfort, and it is by Shantara McBride and Rosalind Wiseman. Um, it's how to have important, brave, life-changing conversations about race and racism. And I came to this book, um, I bought it, first of all, in at the little at the Yankee bookshop in Woodstock and they did order it um, a few copies for a book group that we did in Creechie and they may still have copies. I'm happy to loan this one out. I have read it and it is tabbed and highlighted so if you want to just read the highlights it's really easy to read. This is sort of like the cliff notes already there for you. If they even have cliff notes anymore. Um, but what what happened was um, the, one of the authors is Shantara and she is a black woman from Dallas, Texas, who came to Kimball Union Academy to help run a girls leadership camp a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago. And my daughter was in it and uh, is a middle schooler. It was for middle schoolers, girls, people identifying as girls. And um, she was just a powerhouse of leadership and dynamic and empowerment for these young girls. And she just changed Anna's everything. And I just started following her literally on social media and things. And her thing had been girls, 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 girls empowerment. But um, as a black woman and, and in the current um, environment, things finally, people waking up like me, um, she started doing these talks. And I will say the other author is the Rosalind Wiseman, if you ever saw Mean Girls, the movie or the Broadway show, um, or read the book, um, Queen Bees and Wannabes. It was about the alpha girls in high school and how they ruined lives. <laughs> but basically about, you know, how to raise these young, strong girls. So anyway, these two women were, um, that was their, kind of their thing for a while. And, but Rosalind is a, a Jewish uh, white woman and they, their friendship became really strong and interesting and they, learned a lot from each other. Um, so what happened was I reached out to Shantara after George Floyd, like so many people, um, not knowing what to do and waking up to the reality that is how unaware we were, I was, many of us were. So um, she talks about how she received an email um, or message from a friend, a white friend who said um, after George Floyd, I haven't said as much as I should, mainly because I'm a white girl who's afraid of saying it wrong. I know I have privilege. As a woman, I know I have to watch my back. 
but I would be less likely to be gunned down in the middle of the street just because someone wanted to. And I am sorry, this is a reality for my black brothers. And then, and Chantera's response, her mind, in her mind, she said, when I read it, I wasn't, my first thought wasn't, oh, that's nice, or thank you, or anything remotely close to that. My first thought was, she should say this to people who look like her instead of me. Sounds like, she, she told her she said it perfectly, but she said, please start saying this to white people because white people need to hear it from white people because clearly hearing it from black people and other people of color isn't working at all. So she and Rosalind decided to have a couple of talks um, and they were recorded. And after a talk, a publisher basically approached them and said, your talk needs to be a book. And they, so they wrote this, it's divided into um, three sections. Um, um, it's head and heart. Um, you know, I'm a good person, how, how can I be racist? And um, should I see color? And then it's friends and relationships. Like what does really being an ally really mean? Um, how do I confront loved ones even if they don't wanna listen? Um, and then work in community. Um, if I see something, when do I say something? Um, and why isn't it all lives matter? And so each chapter is divided into a, a common question that people who are on the learning curve start to ask. And it not just tells you, you know, the answer, if you will, but it actually models what to say and what not to say. And um, it's, it really is, uh, it's such an easy to approach book. I mean, some of you have brought really heavy, hard to get into books. I am telling you, I bring this, I bring it to like coffee shops. I bring, I just have it care, you know, and then people will like, what, what is that? And I just, you know, if they show interest, then I, I'm like, oh, let me tell you. Um, and it, it's just super easy to read. And so what, what happened in Creechy was I had reached out to Shantara, much like the, the person who she said, why aren't you telling white people? And she had given me a list of, you know, here, do the work and a lot of things to read. And, and of course, not halfway through any of that, but, you know, so many of the things that you all have brought up are things that are on her list of what to read. But um, what happened was in Guichi, um, our D and I group decided it might be a nice idea to have a book group and open to, to anyone in, in the Quichi um, club and just do the work and read the book together. And so we had a three session, we broke it up into the three parts and had um, a session on each one. And it was like this, Zoom and in person. And then the fourth session, Shantara came and talked, um, Zoom talked. And she just, she just was, She's so, you have to watch some of her talks because she's just like, I can't believe calling you white people up in Vermont are doing the work. This makes me so happy. This is exactly what, you know, with her, with her Southern Dallas drawl. And she just, she's got so much energy. She's an amazing presenter. So I do recommend you look her up. Um, but what happened after the book group is we all didn't have enough. We couldn't, we, we thought this is just the beginning. So now what we're doing is we have a monthly um, opportunity open again to all um, to just courageous comment have the courageous conversations with really no agenda each month it's just what either current events or what's going on in your life or what have you read about or what do you want to practice who do you got to you have to have this awkward conversation with your racist brother-in-law you know it's just going to be continuing courageous conversations over monthly now for, for the foreseeable future any questions and we want to borrow it? What's the title again? Thank you. Courageous, Courageous discomfort. discomfort. Um, and how to have important, brave, life-changing conversations about race the, and racism. The one thing I wanted to say, I talked a lot, um, but this is what um, she, her, not, I mean, it defines to her, you know, to, to them, the author's courageous discomfort is the idea of, um, deciding to live outside our comfort zone to develop the skills that make the world more equitable. Um, being brave enough, taking the first steps, grounding our thinking and actions in the principle of dignity. And that was the part I wanted to say. So every single answer in, that she gives is grounded in dignity. And it makes it so easy 
when someone is confronting you on your why isn't it all lives matter or you know some question that shows a lack of work it's amazing when you just ground your answer in dignity for all it just it, there, there's not an, an, a lot of pushback they you know so anyway um she says when we see they say um the two authors when we see the world through the lens of courageous discomfort we can see that racism is a denial of a person's dignity and it goes on to say you know more about that but it's it's i don't know i thought it was amazing questions I nope. learned about it from you, from you but knowing that it was going on in Quichi, and I bought it, and I, I've read a lot of books on this subject, and I, I absolutely agree. I think it's just so carefully done. So and approachable, like, right? Like your book, <laughs> mine also is, um, has all of these different stickies in it. You know what I liked about it? The real time of discussion and how I remember one particular piece where one of them is in the front of the room and I think they're asked to speak or something and the other one goes to the back of the room. You can see, learn in real time how one's action affects the other and the two very others. different based on, yes, yeah, they black learn. and white differences. And you know, you say, oh, you're so different or what? Well, yes, we are different. So we yeah. see it different and, and they're able yeah. to side by side. You don't have to flip back 50 pages. It's right there. In yeah. Front it's of just you. like why I'm answering this way. And here's a personal story that the two of us went through. Yeah. And what she's talking about was Shantara, the black woman is speaking publicly and Rosalind <coughs> thinks she's honoring her by letting her have the space. So she goes in the back and sits sort of on one of these tables, sort of like with her leg up yeah. and sort of like, you know, taking notes and thinking nothing about it. And Shantara was livid and said, you look like you're my, you know, you're <coughs> observing like, and yeah, checking like on, on the me. TA and your guy. And yeah. yeah, and like I, yeah, she and you know, it was just anyway. They, dignity. I, it was about dignity. The chapters that you've been, I, well, I opened up to. How do I confront loved ones, even if they don't want to listen? Because that's right. something that we've talked about in this book. Yes, yes. yes. Um, yes. In the chapters are divided with what's really going on here. Let, let's look yeah. at the problem. What's going on? And then another section said think about it. And then instead of just saying, <coughs> say this, they describe it as a better approach. Here's something else to consider. Just the, the language of this, I think, is very good. Thank you. And it's also, it's not just for race, racism and anti-racism. It's anything. It's Any political. Dignity. It's religion. Any difficult conversation you have with anybody about anything, you can insert some of those yeah. tactics and models. Yeah. For, Did you have a question? I had a question. Has anybody in your group who's read this and are trying to work with it presented it or gifted it to one of those relatives? Mm. So um, we yeah, talked, actually, it did, actually that did come up. And, um, you know, we talked about, and, and she, I think, even talks about not, you can't force someone to read it, know, you know? know. Um, and of course, when I'm walking around <coughs> holding my book, <laughs> people are rolling their eyes or they're coming up to approach me. So, you know, it's you. It, it. I don't know that anybody actually gave it to a loved one, but it really helped people t about what what to say, what not to say, how to you know, what when to say it. Um, there's there's some really amazing um, because we all have someone, at least someone, right, that would never touch this book and also rolls their eyes when you talk there to. There are either. those who have somewhat of an open mind. Yes, and not a lot of them. But Do yes. <laughs> I thought I was looking. I saw it. Come here. Yeah, you know, if I could have the permission, I am on the group screen up there. So, um, I, can I have permission you can to do speak it from my seat? Yes, fine. You can um, do it from there. I mean, this has been so rich for me from the get go this morning. I started out jotting down things that people said, starting with your opening, 1954 in May. 1954 in May, I was graduating from high school in Sumter, South Carolina. And I remember in probably the days and weeks afterwards, but my friends and I were saying, we are so lucky not to be in all the confusion next year for the, re you know, integration. Mm. In 1963, I was teaching English and Social Studies in Durham, North Carolina. I had the first black student of Carr Junior High School in my class, 54 to 63. In South Carolina, it wasn't until 64 
that they had their first integrated, believe me, it was three or four or five kids at the time. Um, fast forward another 10 years or so, my sister's youngest son was in high school in Conway, South Carolina. He went to, I've forgotten the name, it was one of the early uh, charter or private schools so that he wouldn't have to go to the integrated Conway High School. So from the get-go, I've been living from the get-go, it takes me back to when I was first born. I was born in Gaffney, South Carolina, and my father died when I was four and a half. And um, at the time, those first four and a half years of my life, my mother was teaching school. My father was working as an automobile mechanic across the street at the garage. My sister, my one sibling, was already in elementary school. So I was being in the care from morning until supper time of Lily Lee Pettit, whom I called Mammy. And she remains the dearest person in my life. I didn't even know my mother and father. I never knew my father because he died when I was four and a half. And that's when we moved to Sumter. So I grew up in South Carolina and North Carolina until the age of 29 when we moved to Philadelphia, the suburbs. And uh, we were in stores, Connecticut, for a while. And um, I came up here. But when you mentioned that 1954, it just took me on a trip. And then you had your quotations. I forgot who it was. Reading and learning is important, he was saying. Well, I'm thinking, so is understanding. You can read and you can learn and say, oh, that was good. I learned and I read. But if you don't understand, and I'm flash forwarding to the end of what I'm going to say today. The book, last two books that I've read, the most recent ones, that just whacked me with understanding is Jeff Charlotte's The Undertow, because it takes you through his pain of living through the four years with Trump. And he, Jeff, would, Jeff is a professor at Dartmouth, and um, Jeff would go to Trump's rallies and he would talk to people. He went to Ashley Babbitt's funeral in California. Ashley Babbitt, the woman who was shot. And his response among the people gave me an understanding of people in California, the Midwest, all kinds of places like, holy cow. I mean, we all have our things we've said about um, people opposite us on the political spectrum. But to hear his experiences it's just insane. It's called it, the undertow. The undertow. The undertow. And um, that you know, I had to put the book down for a while and just read something else because I was so shaken by it. This is it, the undertow. Um, and the other one is Barbara King Solver's book, Demon Copperhead. Demon Copperhead. David Copperfield. It, you know, it's a reaction. That one, too, is disclosure, and it's mostly Kentucky, Tennessee, and it's about fentanyl and about um, foster care and the whole system. And that also is like Jeff Undertow in, in, the, in that it just, it really discombobulated me. Mm -hmm. But every time I said, I'm going to put this thing down, I'd have to go back to it. And that's the way... I perceive some of you North New Englanders dealing with racism, you know, it, because it is, it will whack you in the face. The two most significant books I've read, I've got a whole bookshelf of books about these kinds of things, but the two most significant ones have been stamped from the beginning. This is Ibram Kendi's book where he, he just, it's his historic, his historical nonfiction, but he has a way of making it seem like Barbara King Solver's flow as a novel flows. And the other book that was so important to me is this one, The Warmth of, of uh, Other Sons. It's an, another Isabel Wil Wilkerson book, The Road Cast. But this book takes you through the lives of these people and tells you why five or six million black people ended up in the North for industries and whatever. Um, and it will give you some understanding that you need along with what you're reading and um, learning. Um, I, I have to mention too that 
somebody mentioned podcasts. One podcast I hook on is called Brutal South. It's written by a guy in Columbia, South Carolina. And I, when I came across it online, I thought, Columbia, South Carolina, Brutal South, I want to check that out. <laughs> and uh, he sometimes has, you know, not much to say, but other times he just touches my nerves and my heart. Uh, so podcasts are really worth exploring. Yeah. Um, and the, the mention of empathy, I think, is significant. And that's what caused me to put these books down sometimes. But when you feel like, we can't deal with this, mm -hmm. then just give it a minute and go back to it. Because that's what you need. You need to, to, to realize why you were so disturbed and so distressed. Um, for those my books. PJ, is Lily Lee Pettit, that's who was your caretaker? That was, she was my mammy. She, your mammy. You know, yeah. Is she still and, alive? You know, once I'll say one more thing. Um, when my daughter was a sophomore in college here, I came up for the, they used to have alumni. Parents could come and have, I forgot what they were called, but they were summer courses. And our Donald Peace was the one who was conducting the discussion among our, our group. And um, it, it was about something about, um, I think it was when they were trying to get rid of the Indian as the mascot. And it was the first thought, oh no, it wasn't, that was later. Uh, this was about women, because my daughter entered it in 1983, and they had only begun taking women in the early 70s. And, you know, there was a lot of tension in the room because there were four or five, excuse me, males, um, who were saying, yeah, you know, like that was a big mistake. Um, and so we were talking about teachers um, having protests, not what do you call it when a teacher is protesting, is it protesting when they are saying, we need more pay Striking. Striking, thank you. Um, uh, and we were talking about that, and people were mentioning experiences at the time, because that was a, a thing at the time. And uh, Donald Peace made, made a comment, and um, he and I sort of knew each other at that point in time. He asked me, he said, well, you taught in the South. What about that? And I said, never had strikes in the South. Southerners are too polite to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that was true. That was how Southerners kept black people and how they related to them. Everybody knows their place. But nothing like that's going to happen here. What's happening in Louisiana? No. And if you, if you notice today, it's Mississippi and Louisiana I mean, where the harsh treatment. South Carolina knew how to hide. Remember Strong Thurman? All the Dublin speak, Richard Nixon getting the folks from South Carolina. It's it's a really unique spot, South Carolina, because uh, it's all about don't don't say anything, don't say anything. <laughs> so I'll end with that. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned is something that I experience almost every day when I read the. Um, the calendar, the Equal Justice Initiative calendar. It's one of the ways that I have learned a lot of history is I read this day in history and I often look at them and I say, I was alive then. I look at the dates and I say, where, where was I then? That's so, that was such a big thing, that fire that burned all these children that were locked in why didn't I know that? So I, I immediately go to look at the New York Times for that day to see, was it on the front page? Was it on there? Was it? And it was. It was on the front page. And that was a paper that came into my house when I was growing up every day. How did I not know? I was in elementary school old enough to know. How, how was this not? Did we not discuss this around the dinner table? Did I? Anyway, there are so many of those things from this day in history. I was alive. But... But uh, not knowing, I, I have a few things. It's getting, it's it's getting late. People are going to start getting um, anxious to go. So I'm going to. I have I have a few, but I'm not going to do what I was going to do. But there are some that I can't not. This I'm going to start. We with want to ask some people online. Others online have. Are there any wanna... of you? Are there other people besides Josh who had something? Marjorie, you know what? Well, before I do mine, you do yours. Well, you know, I'm going to recommend a novel. 
for all for many of the reasons I've been writing down storytelling, developing empathy, rhythm of language, all these things that is a great it's a great thing to have a novel going at the same time I'm reading um, nonfiction. Um, and there's just a whole nother perspective. You all know that. So um, this one I read last year. Um, it's called The Final Revival of Opal and Nev, which is N-E-V. Uh, it's written by Dawny Walton, uh, published in 2021. And... Um, I, I'm so excited about the experience I had reading this that, that I, I don't want to say too much. So I'll, I'll tell you what the publisher, Simon uh, and Schuster, said about it. An electrifying novel about the meteor rise of an iconic interracial rock duo in the 1970s, their sensational breakup, and the dark secrets unearthed when, the, when they try to reunite decades later for one last tour. Um, this has a, uh, this is written by a black woman. Um, and I listened to it and I, and I really urge you to listen to it rather than to read it yourself. Although I'm sure it's really good just reading it. Uh, it has so many voices and th there, and so many um, accents and rhythms and the, the recording, the recorded version has a number of um, readers that really get into the British accent, deep, so deep South accent, New York accent. It all has, it's, it's, it's based on, it talks a lot about the structural racism of book publishing, of music, the music industry, um, cultural differences and indifferences. Uh, British, there's a, you know, one of the duos is a British uh, musician. It's, it's just spectacular. It runs the whole gamut of emotions. Um, it was really great. So, let, um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say about it. It's just, I cannot tell you how fun it was and touching and um, yeah, idea. wonderful. Wonderful. The final revival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You know, it's so good to have a novel in the midst. So yeah. it sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I, I brought this one um, is a present to me from my son-in-law, Pete, who um, is a used book, that's his business, used book. This is not an old book. It was a newly made version of the Green Book, the Guide for Black Travelers. And I really, he said, he, he texted me one day and said, I found a copy that's just, it's new. It's been reissued, an old one. And I, he said, I bet you think it was fun. And I do think it's fun. I'm just quickly going to pass it around. You can look at Vermont and New Hampshire very quickly. Oh, there were yeah. not very many here, but just mm -hmm. you can pass it around just to be fun to look at. Yeah. Um, this, how, how the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. Did we ever talk about this? Yeah. Around? I don't think we did. Yeah. I, I recommend, it's a reckoning with the history of slavery. He's He's a really good writer. I'm not going to go into detail. I marked a bunch of pages to read. That's another but one I read this year. Did you? Yeah. Did you? Really, yeah, I, I think it's really excellent. Um, I also made a note to myself that very recently I re-saw um, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. That's a film from 1989. I was just curious to know if I would think it was outdated and just didn't have any meaning anymore. It just it really blew me away. It is unfortunately about as relevant today as it was then. And I, I recommend looking at it again. Um, the, the, the husband and wife 
co-authors, William Darity and Kirsten Mullen, are the two people I have been the co-authors here that I've been trying to get to come to difficult conversations about race. They have written from here to equality. They don't have time for us until January of 2024. So I said, I, I really don't schedule that far in advance. So I, I, brought, I bought their book and it's it's really all about reparations and why it's important. And I have marked some places. I have not read the whole thing, um, but I've read parts of it. And it's it's also very dense and and not fun. What is it? <laughs> but 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 I think a a a book that is is saying what needs to be said and why it needs to be said, and not little piecemeal here and there and here and there why we really have to look at it appropriately. Um, the one, this one I learned about from Pat, and but I don't think we've ever talked about it here. And it's, I, I bought it because you had read about it. Um, it's called Systemic Racism 101. And just like Do the Work, it has some really fabulous graphics. Here's, it, this looks like, um, um, a game. It looks like Candyland, you know, where you go from square to square. But uh, but in fact, what it's talking about, it's a graphic depiction of a day in the life of people of color in terms of health, transportation, education, criminal justice, environmental injustice. Um, it's it has so many um, specific. What I like about this book is there are very clear explanations for, for example, individual racism, institutional racism. What is the difference between that and structural racism? So it's just, it takes things that are very um, basic um, and shows um, the equity, the huge disparity in terms, as, as Sven, you were talking about, the, the income inequality. And the last thing I'm going to say is at the back, there are fantastic resources, a lot of other resources in the back of this book, other things to read and listen to. So, uh, Systemic Racism 101. It's, it's not mad, honey. It's not, but it's, it's, I think, really valuable. And people learn in so many different ways. Some people visual, some people auditory. I think, Marjorie, I think it is fun to listen to, to books, too. I've been listening to um, South South to America. And it's Imani <coughs> reading it herself, uh, which is really wonderful. Is there anybody else who had something to present or has a question for? I was, so much. I was just going to say, because I was in the bathroom when you were talking about it, look at all your books. So much this one I listened to. This one I listened to. I highly recommend it. Listening. And also, there is a youth version if you want the clip notes. Great. I might have listened to that. <laughs> from the beginning. Stand from the beginning. I, mean, I wanted to yeah. say that when you were talking. Oh, yeah. Other, other, um, but you, everybody, everybody will get a copy of the list that is being created. Great. And there are um, Pastor John's things that he, he sent three things to be included on the list. Do you want to just say what they are? Say again. You want to say what they are? I have to, I get, they're in my phone. He, he sent it to me this morning. Um, I, I have a question. Anyway. Teresa, yeah. you mentioned, you talked about yeah. dignity. Pardon? You talked about dignity. Yes. That, that's central. What, I'm not sure. I, understand what that really means. I mean, so it's just treating people. It, if people are, if, if someone comes to you as a, a someone who's doing the work, right, and believes in systemic racism and believes, you know, that there is a, a real unfairness, inequity in our systems, in, in all of our systems, and someone says, well, why isn't it all lives matter? You know, why? And you say something, your response shows Dignity. I am doing this because I believe in dignity for all. Don't you believe in dignity for all? You know, so that's, 
I think that's how she, am I, am I saying, do you think that I'm saying that right? I mean, I don't know if you read the whole thing. I think she, I did read the whole thing. I think some of it, the idea of dignity is giving people sort of a face-saving way. It's easier to approach somebody that you, um, that who's saying something and you want to get them to hear what you're saying is to find a sort of the, the, the common thing that you, that you might have in common, but without sort of lasting it's personal to me and that's why i'm doing the work and i believe that every, yeah someone could come back and say well if you believe in dignity for all then don't you think all lives matter i don't know that i have an answer for that one but well, I, I think we've talked about that well black lives white lives have, have to matter mattered. white lives and black lives have to matter for all lives to matter right right that's the response but also for example in a in a situation where you hear a crude joke and people are laughing and you're not laughing and they say, well, you used to laugh at that. And you say, well, you know, I've rethought about that, you know, and that's really not, that's very anti-Semitic. And I'm just thinking, you know, from a dignity perspective, I wouldn't want someone to make that kind of joke about my Irish heritage. Or So if you just sort of have that in your mind, as opposed to, I am a black advocate of the bud, and I have all my research and I, you know, anti-racism and you throw the language at them that they're already hating because they watch Fox News, sorry. Tone it down. But, but you, if personal. you approach it from that sense of, I just believe in dignity for all. It's it's so much easier yeah. to Thank to you. kind of diffuse. So, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I have two books to recommend, but um, I don't have a whole lot to say about them because I've hardly begun. Um, but you might be interested to know about them. I uh, yes. know Jeff, Jeff Charlotte who is a professor at Dartmouth, uh, has written a book, um, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, and it's called The Undertow. Oh, yeah. You just oh, did yeah. that. Speak about it. And so I got a copy, and I've just begun, but I'm very impressed, and I think you would be as well. And the other one is uh, Trevor Noah's book, oh, called yeah. Born a Crime, uh, is it? South yes. Africa. Born, um, born a crime. Yeah, born a crime. And uh, he's, as, you, as you know, if you know anything about him, he's a very engaging uh, person, and the writing is is uh, equally um, captivating. So. Oh, thank you, Sue. So those are good. Those are really excellent to put on the list. Some of these um, may have been on previous lists, but I, I don't. Uh, that's fine. I don't, because I, I think born a crime we might have talked about before, but it's good. It's good to have it be reminded again, and and um, we'll we'll put it on. We'll put both of those on the list. Uh, does anybody have any um, either final thoughts, either recommendations or questions or okay. Yeah, I do. Uh, Black lives, native lands, white worlds. A History of Slavery in New England. <clears throat> this one is written by uh, Harness Stowe. He's a professor up in Washington State, and he's written a new one called, or it's not so new, uh, called Unfreedom. But um, I go to this one every now and then. I've not read it straight through. I've read it in pieces. But I just thought it might be pertinent for more of you than even for me. Jared Ross. Harness well, it's a it's a, a a great joy to be learning with you 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 here you, you back there you you on the Zoom screen here. Thank you all for showing up.